Bridget got off of dock and there was a flash. So we are now into part two of this video. Hi, thank you for rejoining me, part two. <sighs> I will, I'll get better at this, I promise. But there's a lot, there's so much to talk about. This film is so plot rich and everything. And it, you know, you, you, this is a film that takes place in three time periods. There's a lot going on. Thank you for still being here. And so by thank you for still being here, I'm obviously talking to Kat and Erin. Hi. Uh, <laughs> so yes, then we get this lovely, so the doc's explaining what's happened. Marty's saying, oh, it's all my fault. Well, it's all in the past. You mean the future? Whatever. Temporal jokes. I like it. I like semantics. I like the fact you're talking about the fact that whatever happened in the past a bit was actually in the future. Good touch. I like that. All good plot. Now, I've made a note here, there's a scene where they're talking about what's happening in the thing where Einstein's in his basket and you have a cutaway of the dog going hmm, hmm. And I'm just wondering, were they filming the dog? Um, I don't know the dog actor's name, sorry. Were they filming the dog just to get some coverage of, of Einstein? And then they thought, oh, that was a really brilliant moment where you have to find somewhere to put this in. Or did they direct the dog to make that face? Either way, it was a really cute cutaway, so points to Einstein. Um, but yeah, it was a thing. Um, move. Move from. Sh I can't read my writing. Oh, okay, so now Marty is obviously back up to. Um, speaking to Biff, who is technically a stepfather, so we can get access to the building, I guess. And he's watching, um, I think it's Fistful of Dollars. Is that movie foreshadowing? Or is it Marty's inspiration? Had he seen that film before to know what's going to happen to do next? Um, there is a moment where Marty's like, hey, I thought you, you know, that, that was the, light of the, um, the, the night of the famous lightning storm. And Marty, Biff's like, hey, you know, your history, fair play. And I, yeah, nice little moments like that. It's like, you know, you don't have to be complete arseholes. Although <clears throat> Biff is mostly an arsehole. Sorry, sorry Tom, I know you're a nice guy, but mm, Ben's an asshole, you know it. Uh, da, 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 da. One of, oh yeah, Marty then takes the matchbook from Biff's desk, the um, Pleasure Paradise one, sorry I keep knocking the box again. Uh, and then, so the big hole chase up to the roof, big dramatic scene, and um, Tom again is, i got to give it a proxy, it's very kind of hammy the way he's doing it, but he says it with such conviction about, you know, Besides kids, they couldn't find, find the bullet that killed your old man. It's like two McFlyers with the same gun. It's kind of boring on Hammy, but it's still, with so much conviction, you can't really hate it. It's It was really good. So, again, Mr. Wilson, if you're watching this, good up, good performance. I mean, of all the actors in this franchise, Tom Wilson gets the most to do. And he does it so well. Because, I mean, yeah, uh, Leah Thompson does quite a bit as well, but she's basically playing the same character. Um... But the Rain's changes aren't as dramatic as Biff's changes. So yeah, um, yeah, props to Tom Wilson for the whole franchise. Um, so and then on the roof scene, and I was like watching this, and like, Duh, well, how does the Doc know when and where to be to catch Marty? Did they prearrange it? And then I was like, well, how did Marty know that he could jump down at that point? But then I rewound it uh, on this viewing. Marty does look down. He is looking around. It's not just, you know, I mean, if you think, oh, he's looking, well, this is a high place. No, no, he's actually looking. You can see him looking, and is he sort of the camera pans back to the... So you're looking down, you're seeing Marty's view of the the ground. You see, you know, and we get a reverse shot of behind him, and he is looking either way. And just before he jumps, he does take a quick glance down. And then you see him sort of float back up, and then, you know, Doc opens the door, like a boss, knocks Biff out. And it's awesome. November 12th, 1955. Tom Temporal Cosmic Nexus, or huge coincidence? You decide. I will put a link to a survey. I will not put a link to a survey. They're going back to 1955, the night of the thunderstorm. Because it's circular. It's nice. I like it. Um, and then you've got Doc's... Um, Dramatic reading, we must succeed, which again, I call Christopher Lloyd's treasure. Um, we meet young Biff again, 
very fresh face. Really, because you, in in order, we meet, we see Biff, 85 Biff, we see Old Man Biff, we see Alternate 85 Biff, and then we see Young Biff again, and even compared to Griff, he looks so, he does look a lot younger and very fresh faced. So again, big up to Tom Wilson. Um, sorry, Thomas F. Wilson. Uh, and he's got a good arm, he's teasing the kids with the ball, he just chucks it straight into the roof and like, yeah, good arm, give him pops for that. Again, Marty's a punchy bag, gets the um, cans landing right in the twins. Because, ah, that looks nasty. That looked nasty. And then you get the, um, the scene, uh, the, this is the fun thing about this movie, is once it goes back to 55, you get some scenes or like little filler scenes that you didn't have time for or didn't have the impetus to do in the first movie, including a sequence when <clears throat> Lorraine's showing off her dress to her friend, and then, you know, Biff's all like, oh, you're going to be my girl, and he's like, she's like, Biff Tan, I wouldn't be your girl even if you had a million dollars! I'm like, is that a foreshadowing? Because we've already seen what happens. So it's like a, an interest, it's like a reverse, reverse shadowing? I don't know, but yes, Dorraine, if he had a million dollars, you would marry him, but you wouldn't be happy. Sorry, girl. Uh, and then old Biff meeting up with um, young Biff. Which led me to thought, Biff's got a really nice car, which he's just had to pick up and had $300 worth of damage done to it yet to pay for. Does Biff have a job? Or we do see him live with his grandma. Does he have an inheritance? But then if he's under 18, does he not get the inheritance he's under, becomes of age? I mean, is that 18? Is that 21? How do he pay for the car? How does he pay for his gas? How does he pay for the maintenance? So either he actually does have a job that he's good at, and as discussed before, he is actually quite a successful business person in whatever he does, or has he got some inheritance that he's sort of living off of for, for right now? Did he inherit the, inherit the car? These are questions that never get answered, but I think are interesting. Um, and then there's a there's a cute scene where young Biff is eye rolling old Biff, and again we get some amazing split screen work. So gotta love the split screening. Uh, and then you get a cute scene which I, I think TV shows might have a name for. It's the old trope where someone is talking about or around somebody else, and then somebody else doesn't hear anything. You know, like, oh, it, it's like an invisible wall. Like, but no, actually, Biff, uh, Marty's in Biff's back seat. He's whispering, and you know, obviously, it's like a stage whisper, so obviously, the audience can hear us. The audience can hear him, but he's not a million miles away. He's not like millions of miles away from Biff. He's, you know, this close to Biff. So you actually have like Marty whispering into the radio, and then you see Biff playing with his with his stereo radio, car stereo. To seeing what's what's that what's that noise what's going on, uh, yeah that's a really cute little detail. So again, props for that. Uh, sorry, and then we get the introduction of Ooh La La, um, the the scene where Doc meets himself again, which is a really cute scene and a really nice moment between the two of them, two characters, two Docs. It's a cute scene. I quite like it. Um, yes, yeah, the introduction of Ooh La La. And then <clears throat> Strickland's saying to Biff, one day I'm going to have you right where I want you. Detention. How has Biff not gotten detention before? He's clearly the biggest school bully. He's a, you know, we saw in the first film Strickland's aware of him being a big bully. I don't know. I don't know why he hasn't been in detention before. Maybe he's just, I mean, maybe he just does it where, where Strickland can't see him. But again, ooh la la, has a dust jacket on it. Remember that. It's important. Oh, hey, past Marty. Seeing yourself like that must be weird. Uh, and then, obviously, they have the cute scene where um, Marty sliding, well, current Marty sliding past um, past Marty, and agreeing with what he's just said to Lorraine. Again, cute moments. Very good um, green screening or split screening work on that. Uh, whiskey. Uh, the whole. Okay, so we got the scene in Strickland's office where Marty's following Strickland because he thinks Strickland's got the almanac and then you know got the cliche with the whiskey in the bottom drawer and the teacher has to drink that 
This whole thing is actually quite cute because you've got Marty chasing around and he's sitting under the desk and then he tries to reach up and get it and then his hands get trapped. So it's just, ha ah. ha That was the one thing I remember in the cinema going, ooh, when you know, he's biting his hat to um, not scream. You get some really cute plunky music, like a very plunky version of the um, theme tune in that, episode, that sequence as well, which is really, I like that. It's a really cute um, plunky, but yeah. It's a good version of the music. I don't think it's on the score. I've got the um, both two or three of the soundtrack scores. Uh, the first, yeah, the first one's just the um, first movie, and then the second one is music from all three movies. So I don't think it's got that little plunky tune in it, which is a shame. But yeah, it's a cute scene. But it's an inter it's an interesting thought I had. Is sorry, it 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 it. There we go. Put them all over there somewhere. Pick them out when I need them. <sighs> Marty chases Strickland because he thinks Strickland has the almanac. But in this sequence, none of them, you know, Strickland and Biff don't know that anyone's chasing it. So this scene, if you assume correctly, happened with or without Marty's presence. Biff gets caught drinking, Strickland catches up with him. He confiscates the sports statistics almanac from Biff, except we, the audience, get the glimpse of it being ooh la la. And then he takes that away and confiscates it. He never actually took away the almanac, and that would have happened regardless. Whether Marty was there or not, Strickland never took the almanac. He always took ooh la la. So Marty following him, kind of a dumb move, I guess, but would might have realized that so that was kind of interesting again that was the thing i thought was interesting is like yeah strickland never had the almanac he was just um you know pursuing an untamed ornithoid geek points if you get that reference um but then we get the great moment where so mike's like yes no it's not the thing it's ooh la la because of the dust jacket which is why it's important that both the almanac and ooh la la had dust jackets. So, how are we going to find Biff? How are we going to get the book? Oh wait, George is about to knock him out. So we get a great moment when Marty actually sees it this time and he's like, yes! Awesome point. Watch it, waits to make sure that his other self has gone away, that he can't be seen. And then he says he knows CPR to help Biff and then punches him out again. And again, I have to ask the question, how long has Marty been waiting or wanting to punch Biff out? And now he's gotten to do it twice in as many days. That's kind of cool. And obviously he steals the almanac back. Um, so yeah, Chase is, um, gets himself chased into the dance hall. He sees Biff gang after him. And Doc's like, well get out of there then! And Mark's like, no not me, the other me, the one that's off on stage playing Johnny Be Good! Which is a 12 inch version, because of the timing of this movie is a longer version of Johnny Be Good for necessity. Again, there are probably videos out there that have lined up all the clips and sorted out and worked out the timings. I am not that channel. If you see some of those, have at, um, they're probably quite enjoyable. So yeah, but in this case, they by necessity extended the Johnny Be Good sequence so that you can have past Marty and current Marty or the two Martys, you know, one on stage and one in the, in the um, catwalk. Um, making sure he doesn't get clonked on the head again. Uh, so yeah, that's good. That's another example of slightly dodgy green screen where you see the um, cut out between um, past Marty um, when you can see the, because the camera's angled to see the catwalk. Again, slightly dodgy green screening, but overall great. Again, twinning effects on the two Martys. Um, so we get the Indiana Marty where he's like, boom clogs the gang with the sandbags, done, runs away. Except he doesn't go away. He stops and watches George, um, Lorraine and George, well, George is actually cropped out, but he goes and watches Lorraine talking to him, his past self. No, Marty, just, just go, just go. Oh, wait, now you've been, yeah, now Biff's just caught up with you. And then, wallop, Marty gets knocked out by himself. Because he didn't like Biff calling him chicken. One, you should have gone straight away, not stopped and watched. 
to stop overreacting when people call you chicken. I know it's a plot point, but all this is all your fault, Artie. The whole thing, buying the Ormac in the first place and then sticking around and getting yourself into further trouble. No, no, just, just go. But he does, and then Biff he gets knocked out by himself. Biff sees the almanac, steals it back, and like Biff's like, "What the hell? Steal my stuff?" And technically, it's Marty's to begin with, so Marty just took back what was already his. But Biff doesn't know that, and you know, as far as he's concerned, he's he's taking back his own property because it was gifted to him. Um, and then we get the sequence with the uh, DeLorean, excuse me. Where uh, Doc is launching up to come and meet uh, Marty, and you you see the bunting get caught around the wheel, and he just like takes it with him, and that's this is again a nice little sequence of continuity. You see the bunting get caught around the wheel. You see the Doc gathering it up to presumably put it in the car, take it away, and then later it comes into play later on. I like that. So car chase scene. He's kind of cute, so again, Doc launch, you know, puts Marty down. Marty attaches to um, Biff's Ford. The car flies off. Who shut the door? They're Goldwing's doors. They're, I'm assuming it's quite a reach to go and get it, but the door, the passenger side is is closed. Don't know who did that, but anyway. So Marty's now hanging onto the car. He opens the door. Oh yep, don't mind me trying to nick your book again, and then we get the chase sequence. Where again, Marty gets punched in the face. Probably on his, probably on him. So yeah, Marty gets punched. Bit of a chase scene. He manages to flip round the car, roof. That whole that whole scene with the hoverboard on the roof. Very cool sequence. Uh, tunnel chase again has slightly odd CG when the um, close-ups of Biff. I'm not sure again what's that about, but otherwise really good, really good film, really good at its time. Big cheek chase. The bunting comes into effect again. So check off bunting, where um, you know Doc's tied it to the steering column, pulls Marty up and out of the way of danger. Shit! Yep, more manure. Awesome. Really good scene. Um, oh. So, Chekhov's matchbook. Is that a Chekhov? It wasn't the first act. It was the first act. Here's a Chekhov's matchbook. You see Biff with the matchbook, you see it later on in the hotel, and now Marty's using it to burn the almanac. In a very conveniently placed pail. Is it common to see wooden buckets around billboards? I don't know, but there we go. At least it's you know, good fire safety, kids. If you're going to have to set a fire to erase your past, you know, your mistakes from the past or the future, Always do it in a contained, in a in a fireproof container. So although the um, bucket being there is convenient, it is a good safety tip. And then obviously everything switches, um, all the the matchbook changes from the Pleasure of Paradise to um, best detailing. Um, the newspapers change, so George is no longer dead. He's a recognised writer, and the doc is no longer committed. He's commended. You don't want to get struck by lightning! <sighs> Marty, Marty, Marty. Famous last words. And then our, our young hero is stuck in the middle of the road, in the rain. Along comes a mysterious car with a tall dark stranger, Western Union. Guy's quite happy about having lost the bet. And then he's like, dude, not too much reading over Marty's shoulder, but he is showing him a little bit from the rain. And he does offer to help him, which is kind of cool. And then we get the scene where he's like running. We cut to the scene, the end of the first movie, where we have the dramatic is the car gonna make it and get struck by a lightning sequence? Push! There we go. The Lorian's gone into the future. Bye, Marty! Woohoo! Oh, hey, Marty! Faint. To be continued! Or concluded, sorry. To be concluded. And then we get the trailer. I don't know the trailer was something that turned up in the American versions. Um, but it's, it's been on every version I've seen. So then we have the trailer for Back to the Future Part 3. This has been a very long video. Well, two videos. So, yeah. I don't know what happened there. I'm... See, see, this is what happens when I try and speak slower. But, again, there was a lot to unpack with this movie. Sorry, I'm 
do my socks up, I forget cold. Um, a lot to unpack with this movie. Yeah, overall, I really enjoy it. Um, I think I said to you, the its top 500 position is actually 498. So it's like, right near the bottom of the list. There's a lot going on in this film. I, mean, you, I said before, the first film's up here. It's, it's uh, sorry, 23. And the next one, the second one's down here. That's that's a big gap. I mean, I'm t I'm listing it in my um, Excel, so you know if, if you were to print it all out, it's quite a ways down the list for a lot for a film that has a lot happening in it and a lot of clever plotting. There's a lot of other films on this list, which we will get to all, all of them at some point. But yeah, that that has been Bats of Peace too. That has been a lot to talk about. Overall, I, I still love this movie. It still holds up. The um, special effects really hold up. There's a great moment when Marty's lighting the fire and the hoverboard's just sat there and it is actually sort of moving around and wiggling in the wind, which I quite enjoy. I thought it was quite a good effect. But that is my very long review. I should probably end it here. For those of you who have been watching the whole thing, thank you, because this is way longer than I intended it to be. Um, please again if you haven't already follow me at felix11 and please also like share and subscribe and if you are at the end of this video thank you because you know this is two two half nearly half an hour videos and if you've made it all the way to the end thank you you're awesome you all you 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 and you and you you're awesome this is weird there i am there you are awesome the person watching this video to the end and um, listening to me ramble some more so yes please do follow me uh like share subscribe all that fun stuff and i will see you in the past all right thanks for your time bye bye